Prince, and welcome to The World Transformed. Tonight, we're talking about amazing topics. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. Glad to be uh, doing an amazing show for this evening. And, uh, yeah, we used to do Amazing Wednesday, and Wednesdays are still great for amazing shows, but you know, it turns out we can do an amazing show anytime. Anytime can be. <laughs> That's right. In and fact, I think we used to, even back in those days, observe that they're pretty much all amazing. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, any rate, well, whatever uh, night of the week you find yourself listening to it, uh, we're glad you are, and uh, yeah, we've got some stuff here, so let's get into whatever it. Whatever day of the week it is. Let me just, let me just note that this is our 799th podcast together, Stephen. So we started this in 2005. That was and uh, and we started it so early we didn't know we were we didn't know we were podcasting. We called it internet radio. And yeah, uh, we didn't even have the term. We didn't have the term. And of course, we learned probably several years later. We we learned that a couple months before we started doing our thing. Someone in, coined the term podcasting and did their first podcast in, also in 2005. So yeah, we are we are OG podcasters, my friend. So we go back. I keep telling everybody I've been doing it for 11 years, 13 years for crying out loud. We've been yeah. Doing this, so yeah. actually, 800 in 13 years doesn't sound as good. So that's why we got to keep cranking them out. We got to get. Yeah, to, I think we are cranking them out uh, roughly at the rate or have been about about three a week. So yeah, if we can just keep up that pace, we we will get there, no doubt. That's right. We'll get to 2,000 before, yeah. you know, too long. But anyway, never mind any of that count stuff. We'll talk about that more in our next show because now we've got to talk about some really amazing stuff beginning with this new lithium battery technology can simply suck up CO2 to power itself. How about that? That's from Impact Lab, Thomas Fry's site. And this reminds me a little bit of we, we did a show uh, – about six months ago, I think, maybe not that long ago, we were talking about the, sh- the name of the show was Gold from the Air. We were talking about taking carbon from the atmosphere and making carbon nanotubes. So that was awesome right. because here's this really valuable substance you can produce, and you can actually pull carbon from the atmosphere to produce it. Well, here's this is this goes at one better, right? This is how how about everybody has batteries that are just pulling CO2 right from the right right from the atmosphere. I mean, if you were to introduce something like that on a large enough scale, would it not have an offset to the amount of carbon being dumped in the atmosphere? It seems to me like it would. Yeah, it seems, it seems like a no-brainer that it would. There are other more potent greenhouse gases, that, but they could also potentially be made into fuel. Uh, methane is a fuel, and it's, it is a greenhouse gas that's 10 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It's just that we have so much more CO2 than methane in the atmosphere. So who knows? Maybe that is the way we figure out how to set the thermostat on this planet, is that we pull out the right amount. I can see the uh, nations of the world, uh, the northern nations, having a discussion to want to pull out more or pull out less, rather, and uh, the, and the uh, equatorial nations want, wanting to pull out more and getting it cooler. So there's room for argument over that, and I think we will argue over that when the time comes. It would be very interesting if in about 20 years the big debate was can we allow people to keep using mobile devices powered by these batteries when we know about the environmental impact they're having. Right? It's like we're <laughs> sucking so much carbon out of the atmosphere that people are worried about that. We've got we to decide you know, where we're going to set our levels so that we have more or less the same kind of environment for, for wherever you are in the world. So, yeah, <laughs> I can see people, that. would be awesome. People pulling so much so much carbon out of the atmosphere that, that we're threatening to bring an ice age. Now, the story is, does not contemplate the battery in your cell phone, unfortunately, being able to just pull it out of the atmosphere and so you never have to plug in your cell phone. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about using CO2 from major plants that produce a whole lot of CO2. Yeah, and yeah, and, uh, and and taking that CO2 and turning it into uh, an additional fuel. So basically turning something that's a, a big problem to get rid of, exhaust basically, and in, instead turning it into a positive. You know, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade kind of thing. And uh, Right. Well, for our purposes today, I turned it into a consumer product. But even if it's not, even if it's a big industrial product as is described in the article – Right. You can just you can imagine. Well, you can even burn coal, right? You burn coal, and and the plant next to the coal burning plant, you put five of these batteries, right? And so they're just gonna they're they're gonna make the coal plant effectively carbon neutral, right? Because they're gonna suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere that that one is that plant is putting into the atmosphere. So we're we're creating carbon 
when when we generate energy and we're creating energy from the carbon that we've generated. It seems like it, it could be a very virtuous cycle there, providing us a lot more energy. I'm not really a big fan of burning coal, but I'm saying that's one potential uh, scenario for something like this. That's right. And I mean, we get good enough with carbon capture. Maybe we do on a large scale pull stuff out it pull it straight out of the atmosphere you know it, maybe we can uh at some point do that uh but uh this this actually this article is actually talking about getting it closer to a, a more potent source which is you know a major factory or something and so cool stuff either way either way it's good stuff all right well what's up next engineers develop a process to 3d print cells to produce human tissue such as ligaments and tendons and you know, Phil, this is the sort of thing we've been we've been kind of following this sort of thing for some time. And there are easy things that can be three D printed that we put in our bodies. I I have a tooth, actually, a single tooth that is three D printed. And it just is an easy thing to do. Uh, if you're going to have a cap for your tooth, it's got to be. You know, in the past they'd have to sit there and just whittle at it until it, it fits your mouth. Pretty much is what is you know, and they did that sort of thing by hand. Uh, now they can take measurements and 3D print something and and, and put a cap in your mouth uh, real easily. Now, that's the, probably the simplest possible thing to do, 3D print-wise, re- regarding your body. Obviously, the, the hope is at some point to be able to uh, 3D print using your own cells, whatever organ you need, whether it be a heart or a kidney or whatever, and so that you don't have to ever take uh, anti-rejection drugs. There's never a problem that there's no heart that, that matches you uh, available and when you need one. Forget transplant lists. We will grow your own using your own cells, and it will be just perfectly fine. And uh, that's, that's obviously where we want to go with this, and uh, this, this is another step towards that. Well, this is a really important step because one of the things we've talked about when, when we talked about using 3D printers to produce tissues that could be organs is that you don't get the shape of the organ. Right? We talked about when they, yeah. made a, when they made a heart that you had to use a scaffold of someone else's heart to, in order to make that happen. But when, when you start putting tendons and ligaments out, you're, you're beginning to produce some of that scaffolding. Right? You're beginning to produce some of the, the, the basic 3D printing, 3D stuff that, that, that is actually going to be required to get you to, to a full organ. I mean, it's just one step closer to being one day able to print out a whole 3D body, I suppose. But a step well short of that, but that's very important, is to be able to actually produce full organs. Because, as you said, if someone can 3D print out their own heart, they've got the ultimate, will be accepted, shouldn't be a big problem. It's still a traumatic surgery, but none of the rejection issues. Heart transplant, right? You can get a completely healthy heart made out of your, made out of your own cells. Same with the liver, same with kidneys, and... It's, it's going to be an amazing technology. We're not there yet, but this is a big step, a big step in exactly the right direction that we needed to go. Absolutely. So let's just, we're just going to keep watching this space, right? These things take a while to go through FDA approval and everything. I would, if I had to put a time, limit, a time uh, on it, I'd say it, I'm saying a decade, not to, not to have the technology, but actually to be employed and in regular use. Is, right. uh, is my thought about a decade out. So 2028 is. I'm just going to throw that throw that out there, and, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll revisit it at some point. See if see if how how off I am on that. Absolutely. It would be cool if in that time frame. It would be awesome if in that time frame it's something that's actually being used. Right. Right. If we go if we go 10 years out, and that's this is a treatment that people are actually benefiting from it, in a regular clinical sense. It's not just an experiment anymore, but it's something that really exists right it's right. it's part of medical practice is that is that how far your prediction is going yeah that's 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 what i'm saying okay i think it's probably erring on the side of being a little too optimistic because i'm saying it's through the regulatory hurdles and everything by then yeah, i'm probably being a little bit optimistic but hey we are optimists so that's the deal so a- absolutely yeah all right well our final story is about one of our favorite topics. Amazing story. Our final show here in the 700s, final topic, Researchers Discover How to Slow Aging. This is over on medicalexpress.com, and this is a bit of a press release for the folks who are selling this supplement, but I find this really interesting. First off, it's interesting because, once again, there are so many different dimensions on which aging is now potentially being treated that I think it's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to, is that we keep seeing newer new and different potentially effective ways to address this. And this is a really interesting one. They talk about, in the headline, they talk about slowing aging. What we're really talking about here 
is slowing the accumulation of senescent cells, slowing down your tendency to build up damaged cells. So we, we know that that's ultimately what aging is. If you, if you want to look at it from the standpoint of the engineering problem, as Aubrey de Grey does, what does it mean to, for, for your body to age? It means your cells get damaged. And more and more damage, the damage accumulates, and you get older. Well, if you can slow down the rate at which cells become damaged, if you can slow down the rate at which they senesce, then you effectively are slowing aging. That's, that's the idea here. And they're talking about a new compound. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Physotin, perhaps, which overall is associated with reducing the level of damaged cells in the body. So just add it to the stack, right? We've already talked about NAD+. We've talked about resveratrol, all of them kind of touching different sides of this coin. And now here's another one that might, might, prove really effective in helping people not to age. What do you think? There are a million ways to attack the problem of aging because it's such a complex problem, right? It's not. Right, right. And uh, Aubrey de Grey uh, has told us that there's seven reasons we get older, and as he sort of outlined it, and you really have to address a lot of those things. Or, you know, he, he said basically you need to address all seven problems or like seven bullets flying at you. You can deflect six and get killed by the last one, right? So you really have to do something about all, all of these things that are happening to you, like you say, it's just a, it's it's another uh, another thing to to follow and an, another potential uh, way of uh, dealing with some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I like about this story, if you follow the link and read this, is they talk specifically in terms of this extending health span. We've talked about that quite a bit. If you don't if you don't look at life extension in terms strictly lifespan, in terms of strictly how many years do you add to the life, but in terms of health span, that is how long will you not be in a state of just falling apart, absolute decrepitude, which unfortunately we have, that's what we've been extending for people up to this point pretty, pretty effectively over the last couple of decades is making people live longer in kind of a falling apart state. Well, the idea of extending health span is to make sure that the last section of life for as long as it can be is still healthy that you're that, that you're still experiencing reasonably good health and you know maybe there's a very rapid decline after the health span it can no longer be extended but it, it it's all about extending quality of life along with length of life and and they talk about that here and you can see where slowing the accumulation of damage would fit right into that right where even if the person doesn't have decade after decade after decade added to their life. If you've added only one decade, maybe that's a lot more quality of life in there than would have been if they're just constantly being treated for diseases or you know, constantly undergoing these these massive interventions. So I think it's I think it's really exciting stuff. Absolutely. All right, Stephen, well that's gonna do it. There it is, seven hundred and ninety nine shows. I'll tell you what, let's do one more and we'll call it eight hundred and then <laughs> and we'll see see where we go from there. It sounds it sounds great. So join us for our eight eight hundredth show and we'll we'll have a good time with that. That'll be our next show. All right, Stephen, great talking with you. Great having you all with us. And until next time, live to see it. Thank you.